Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, coming this evening to tonight's edition of Conversations at the Royal. My name is Lisa Young, and uh, I'm a registered nurse here at the Royal. I work in the schizophrenia department. I'm also a graduate student at the University of Ottawa, and um, I'll explain a little bit more about my background and uh, what I've been up to a little later on in the presentation. Um, so tonight, we're going to be talking about exploring the uh, caregiving experiences of parent caregivers in schizophrenia, which was the topic of my thesis study for my master's. Um, it's a very small uh, part of my master's uh, research that I'm talking about tonight. As you can see, it still says student on there. I thought that I would be finished by now, but such is the way when you do a thesis. If you've ever done one, you might know that yourself. Um, so that being said, there's certain limitations that I have when presenting findings, um, and I'll talk a bit about that as I go. So let's just get started. So first of all, just to get this part out of the way, I'd like to say thank you very much to the University of Ottawa for the financial uh, funding of my master's studies and to uh, the government of Ontario and to the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Centre uh, for some of that funding that made it possible to do this. Of course, thank you very much to my supervisory committee. Amanda Van Dyke was my supervisor, very great researcher and uh, professor at the university, and uh, my committee members as well. Lisa Murata is a, a, a staff nurse here at the Royal, and she was very helpful in, in me getting this all completed. So thank you to everyone who supported that work. Um, and of course, Sheila Dighton, Schizophrenia Society of Ontario, thank you so much for your participation and letting me know exactly and, and getting a sense of what it might be like to be a parent caregiver because Sheila works with a number of parent caregivers with the Schizophrenia Society and was paramount in helping me to uh, recruit my study participants. So, you know, her credibility and her heart and her passion, I think, is really what lended itself well to, to people trusting and taking a chance to be a part of my research. So thank you, Sheila. Um, to my colleagues at the Royal Schizophrenia Department particularly, thank you very much. A um, number of great colleagues, great nurses, a wonderful interprofessional team, and they inspire me every day to do good work here. I'm very proud to be part of that team. So in particular, uh, Joe Baracci, Karen Daly, uh, Reluca, you all made me have opportunities for work that were flexible so that I could do this. And I really appreciate that and your guidance in, in becoming a psychiatric nurse. Uh, some of my study buddies on the weekends, some of the doctors, Dr. Atwood, Dr. Baines, uh, Dr. Rogers in particular, everyone really. But we spent a number of uh, long weekends working away at our, our our passions here and, and a really passionate group and I'm grateful to be a part of that. Um, of course, I'm indebted to the parents that participated in this research. Without your contribution, I certainly could have no study and I really learned so much from you about what your experience has been like and every time I left those interviews, I felt so inspired and humbled and I, it certainly changed me as a practitioner in terms of how I operate with families, how I communicate with families, and what kind of questions I ask and things that I look for. So um, you guys are incredible, and your children are so very lucky to have you. Um, and of course, this is something that I could only know because of my own parents who, you know, this is a phenomenon I understand because if you're lucky enough to have wonderful parents to guide you through your life, you know what a difference that, that makes. And I think it's far more reaching than maybe any healthcare system or provider is if you've had the good fortune of good parents, you know what impact that has on your health and your, your well-being, quality of life. So thank you to my own parents for your love and support. Uh, here's the disclaimer, the part where I say that I am uh, not a graduate yet, unfortunately. Um, so when I'm presenting my findings, uh, just keep in mind that these are preliminary. They're not published. I haven't defended my thesis yet, so there's always a chance that that could not happen. So keep that in mind. I think I'll do just fine, though. Um, the thesis is in progress. So the plan is, uh, after I complete my thesis, that there will be two research studies that come out of this that will be published in um, peer-reviewed academic psychiatric nursing journals. All right, uh, so just a brief presentation overview of what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about situating uh, the researcher and my personal impetus for the research. When you do qualitative research that's within a constructivist paradigm, uh, it's really technical stuff, but 
basically you acknowledge that as the researcher, your own understanding of phenomena has an impact on the research that you create. Uh, and so I do need to let you guys know a little bit about me, so you might be able to figure out where the questions I, I ask come from, and perhaps a little bit of how I might interpret data as a qualitative researcher. I'm going to give a very brief uh, overview of schizophrenia. There are people that are far better at giving those kind of lectures than I am. And just for the purpose of the time we have tonight, uh, it's just going to be brief. So people who maybe don't have that knowledge will feel prepared to receive some of the information. Um, I'm going to present the bulk is the preliminary findings of my qualitative study. Um, so. Again, there was two studies. I did a thesis that was five chapters long. This is preliminary findings that are a small, small piece of chapter four. So there's much more that goes with this, but just so you guys know, it's preliminary findings, it's quotes, it's themes. It's really giving you guys a sense of what these parent caregivers told me was their experience, okay? That's what I'll be talking about. All right, so here we go. Uh, situating the researcher, who am I? This is me. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't resist putting this picture on because this is actually the very first day that I came to work here at the Royal. So it's a very good memory for me. I'd worked four long, hard years at nursing school with no intention of doing anything uh, other than mental health nursing. So. That kind of captures the moment for me. And uh, I would say, you know, most days, like I said, I'm quite grateful to work here and I'm pretty excited. Sometimes need a couple coffees to get going first. Uh, however, it kind of captures the way I feel about the work that we do here and that I do here. Um, so I am a registered nurse and I also did my Bachelor of Science in Nursing at the University of Ottawa. Uh, I am a psychiatric and mental health nurse because that's the area that I practice in. That's my area that I'm building expertise. When I started here at the Royal, I did uh, four months in the recovery program, moved on to the schizophrenia program. And so now that's the integrated schizophrenia and recovery program. So that makes it easier. I maybe don't have to keep explaining that every time. So I've been part of the integrated schizophrenia and recovery program. Uh, currently, I work in the schizophrenia outpatient department. Um, and I've had a number of research opportunities just being a graduate student through the university, as well as with my colleagues in the program, I've had an opportunity to do some uh, research in the program. And I am completing uh, my Master of Science in Nursing at the U of O. Um, so what prompted my interest in looking at this phenomenon? Well, certainly working as a practitioner in the field, there were plenty of opportunities for me to kind of reflect on uh, what is it to be a parent caregiver. A lot of things that occurred uh, on the unit as an inpatient nurse that really made me think about, my goodness, what, what are these parents going through? This is nothing like what I learned in my maternity rotation when we pulled out you know, a piece of paper and asked about who's your mom, who's your dad, let's draw a family tree, basic stuff. There was some pretty serious stuff happening. Um, so what I did is kind of reflected on a number of these experiences and I'll share three of them with you here just to get you thinking about why I did the research. Um, so for example, as a, as a consolidation student in my uh, fourth year of nursing, there was a client who was on the inpatient unit and she was just about ready to be discharged. Um, she was somebody that had a very low tolerance for interactions. So you kind of had to be very brief in each interaction you had with her because she would get quite agitated and had a lot of internal stress. Um, and so this person, we were working towards a discharge and we we're gonna get her back into the community and you know, it was gonna be great and she's gonna get out of the hospital. And in that planning, uh, the doctor set up a meeting with a family member. And when we had that family member there, uh, we, we told them, you know, this is what we're thinking. We think this would be good for your family member, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she, you know, reflected on some of that person's experience. You know, my family member actually has a lot of trauma. She doesn't feel comfortable being somewhere where there's loud noises, where there's uh, men. And she'd had trauma with men, unfortunately. Um, which bits and pieces I knew, but again, I was a nursing student at the time, so I didn't know the whole story. And so I got to see in that scenario that uh, that family member advocating for a woman's only placement 
made a huge difference, um, not only in terms of that person keeping their community tenure, but also quality of life, because what, what a horrible experience that might be if you're traumatized every time you hear, you know, something like that. Um, so that was one example in which it can be helpful in getting people into the community. Uh, some example that really prompted my interest was there was a woman who uh, would often come to visit her son on the unit and her son had been sick of many many number of years and had multiple admissions on our unit and this woman just shocked me because every time she would come you know her, her son was quite ill and whether it was a good weekend whether it was a bad weekend you know, if they'd had a good time and been out and done activities, or if they had been at home and the whole weekend was wrought with paranoia and, you know, being locked away in the basement and couldn't handle what was going on. Um, she was always so gracious and so kind and had unconditional positive regard for her son and was always, you know, if it was a bad weekend, we'll, we'll do better next weekend. And she was so gracious with the nursing staff, even though her weekend had been you know, quite, quite an upset. So I thought, my goodness, how does she do this? You know, what is that? Um, many number of experiences I saw in which family caregivers um, would come and have unfortunately not so great experiences and I'd really see the turmoil and the distress uh, based on them explaining to me to, things to me that had happened in their home. Um, but also things I witnessed on the unit. So I remember having someone who had a capgrass delusion. So in schizophrenia, when you have a capgrass delusion, you believe that um, you know a loved one or someone you know has been replaced by an identical-looking imposter. And so this is what this person saw when she saw her parent. And the parent like would come to visit, and this person would just lose it and freak out and start screaming and get off of the unit and don't come near me. And that was her reality. Like she was sick, and that was her reality. Um, and this mother, I just remember, I thought, wow, how does she cope with this? And one time I tried to comfort her and talk to her, and I, I didn't feel that I had the tools and the understanding necessarily to work through this kind of thing, but it really opened my eyes to, my goodness, like what kind of parent caregiver goes through that kind of experience, except for maybe in populations like this or other brain disorders, of course, right? Um, so those are my three examples. And so I started looking at the literature and going in and seeing what is the caregiving experience for parent caregivers who have schizophrenia. And overwhelmingly, it was burden, uh, a lot, a lot of literature on burden. Um, so a lot of stuff about how parents had very negative experiences and their quality of life was extremely poor and their, their psychological distress levels were through the roof. Um, and then there was a little bit kind of on this idea, you know, parent caregivers help us to discharge people to community and they really help us in terms of, you know, having a, a good stable place in the community and what can we do to get people into the community kind of thing. There's a lot of that. <laughs> and far less looking at what might be, you know, some positive experiences or examples of maybe positive coping. Um, when I first looked at uh, doing this research, I went to a uh, caregiver group and just kind of presented my ideas. And they kind of like, rightfully so, said, what, like, what positive experiences could I possibly have? And uh, I felt kind of like silly for asking. But then at the same time, when they reflected on some of the things that had actually gone well because of their experience, either connections that they'd made or uh, fostering a deeper connection with their child or multiple reasons, um, there is some examples of positive, and we can't negate that. And actually, the research says, please, if you do more studies like this, can you please look at the positives? Um, because if we're going to help people, I know as a nurse, we look at strengths-based nursing, we look at motivational interviewing, we look at a number of ways in which we can engage people and enact change by looking at positives, not always what's wrong, what's going wrong, but what can work, what can we make right, what was a positive, and how can we build on that? So, of course, I was anxious to uh, look at all of those experiences. Um, and actually, sorry, one point I, I meant to say here was I'm hoping that when people are, are coming to this presentation tonight, if you are somebody who's a caregiver for someone who has the illness, 
Um, I'm hoping that you will see in the results that you're really not alone. There is a lot of shared experiences that these parents had, and I hope that that might be in a way comforting and make you feel more comfortable to reach out. I think also um, speaking about these experiences openly in a public environment is important because it is a very different experience. And generally people who don't have that experience don't understand the experience. And so through just saying what it might be or what it might look like to parents. I think that that's helpful in reducing stigma also um, because we know people who have schizophrenia illness are very unfortunately stigmatized in a number of ways and uh, that's also the experience for schizophrenia caregivers so let's shed some light on what that experience is and try to alleviate a bit of that. So just very briefly, uh, schizophrenia is a severe and persistent mental illness. It affects how someone thinks uh, and behaves and feels. There's three kind of clusters of symptoms, uh, positive, negative, and cognitive symptoms. So positive symptoms, it's easy to remember. They might be things that are there that maybe shouldn't be there. Um, so those might be things like hallucinations, delusions, uh, abnormal thought processes, um, like thought disorders. Negative symptoms, a number, I, I'm not listing them all guys, just want to orient you a little bit. So maybe a negative symptom could be somebody has a flattened or blunted affect, so they're not reacting. It's things that are um, not there that should be there. So maybe they have reduced speech, they have reduced uh, pleasure in life. Um, and finally, cognitive symptoms, so these are things that are going on with the brain, so things like executive functioning, people's ability to plan for activities um, and to make decisions, people who um, have difficulty with focus, attention, memory, those are some of those symptoms. Uh, the typical age of onset, 15 to 25. Uh, there's phases, uh, often a prodromal period in which some changes occur that don't necessarily look like schizophrenia. First episode psychosis, this is when things quite often come to, to light for a number of people, abnormal behaviors and the first break of psychosis. Um, often, hopefully that's followed with a diagnosis. And I think I highlighted fluctuate because I think this is a hard thing for caregivers So uh, and anyone actually who's spending time with someone who has schizophrenia. So there's three distinct phases, the acute phase, stabilization, or stable or chronic phase. So if this is someone who truly has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, um, there's related disorders, other psychotic disorders, but typically in this illness, people fluctuate and they go through these stages. So if you have someone who's quite ill and they become stabilized and you think, oh my goodness, they got really sick, what happened, what did I do wrong? I feel maybe guilt or overwhelmed or something. Just try to understand that for a number of people it is a lifelong and it's a chronic illness and it, this is part of the trajectory. So there's ways to get help and um, certainly don't feel guilty. Um, so management strategies should be initiated as soon as possible uh, when a first episode psychosis occurs and the reason for that is to reduce the duration of untreated psychosis, the DUP. So there's studies that show correlations between how long someone goes untreated and what that means in terms of outcomes in the long run. Um, so we try to treat people as soon as possible. I'm sure if you've been a, a, a loved one of someone who has a mental illness, you've faced a number of challenges in getting them into the system. And um, I think that was a major finding of my study and an important finding because we are contributing in part as organizations and as a healthcare system to making that dup longer, right? Um, so people should have early intervention services and a biopsychosocial approach to treatment. Um, there's a number of challenges with medications uh, in particular. Uh, I won't go into all of them, but there's uh, the FGA is first generation antipsychotics. So those are our typical antipsychotics. They have some really negative and nasty side effects. And so sometimes it's hard for people to take their meds when they're dealing with things like, let's say, uh, bradykinesia, so slowed movements, or if they have a tremor, or if they have akathisia, they have difficulty, you know, sitting still, they feel kind of internally activated and they can't sit still. Um, our second generation antipsychotics uh, have a lot of uh, metabolic side effects, so a lot of really good uh, medicines there, unfortunately. There are people who will gain weight and have a number of uh, illnesses that could be, you know, unfortunately made worse or developed in part because of some of these medicines. So 
I think we work as a program to try to address some of these things through a number of ways that we operate and, and teach and give programming. But that's just one challenge. Um, so medication non-adherence is huge, and I know it's not all about the meds, but when people are not taking their meds and they are acutely ill, then this can be a, a big area in which we need to focus on because, um, you know, there's been large antipsychotic trials that have been done and show that people who do have this illness, um, within 18 months, there's a discontinuation rate of about 74%. Um, and people very, very often get very, very ill when they stop their medication. Um, and there's a 90% chance of relapse uh, when somebody stops their medication or is not taking them as prescribed within one year. Uh, so it's very important, the medication for a number of people, for most, if not all. Okay, so schizophrenia and recovery, that's kind of our ultimate outcome that we would like to work on when we work with clients. Um, and Patricia Deegan, who's a wonderful uh, person who is big in the recovery literature, she, she says that recovery involves a new and valued sense of integrity and purpose within and beyond one's disability. Um, so recovery here, we're not talking about somebody has no symptoms, somebody is cured, it's not that. It's that they found new meaning, new purpose. They're working towards goals that are uniquely their own. And they're living a life in which they can feel satisfied and have some quality of life. And certainly that involves the treatment of symptoms also. Um, but it's, it's not a cure. It's recovery. And people do recover from this illness. So there's a lot of hope. <laughs> so that takes us to the main event. Uh, this is a part of my qualitative study. Um, so this is exploring the experiences of parent caregivers, a qualitative study. I will present to you guys um, the main categories of findings, and I'll be reading some quotes that are uh, directly from the parent caregivers that participated in the study. And let me just get started right away. So if you see numbers on the slides, it's for me to look at my paper. That's to orient me. So this was my research question. How do parents experience their role as caregivers for adult children with schizophrenia? The inclusion criteria need to be parents, whether biological or adopted. Um, they need to be a primary caregiver for an adult child with schizophrenia who is over the age of 18. Uh, so schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. I think I had about two people who had a child with schizoaffective disorder, very similar disorders. Um, they had to provide caregiving for a minimum of one year currently or within the last six months. They had to communicate in English. I'm working on bilingualism after this master's, I swear, but that is why. <laughs> and they had to be capable of providing informed consent, of course. What we did was uh, semi-structured face-to-face interviews. They were 60 to 90 minutes in length. Uh, those interviews were audio recorded with everyone's permission and we typed up transcripts uh, afterwards. So I think at the end of the day, I'll tell you how many participants I had, but it was about 750 pages that we typed up from the interviews. And we had to look through that to kind of find themes. I can certainly talk more about the methodology of my study if anyone's interested, but I really didn't want to bore you with that. I thought I'd get right to the meat of it, but I'm happy to answer questions about it. Uh, we did a socio-demographic questionnaire just to get a sense of who are these people that I'm interviewing and, and where do they come from, what is their background. And we did individual and dyads, so mothers alone, fathers alone, mothers and fathers together. This is just a sample to show you guys kind of what the questionnaire looked like. It is the questionnaire that I used. What happens with a semi-structured interview is you have possible probes. So all of these questions are there. It doesn't mean that I have to ask them boom, 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 yes, no, let's go kind of thing. Uh, what I'm doing is having a conversation with someone. So it, it doesn't have to stick quite strictly to what these questions are, but they're jumping off points. And I do think I was able to, uh, through the interview process, probably get back to answering all of the question in one form or another. But if an interview took a really interesting tur uh, turn and I thought it was really relevant and the caregiver wanted to share that, then we, we went in that direction. And that is how semi-structured interviews happen. So who were my caregivers? There were eight that were mothers and four that identified as fathers. 
Their ages ranged from 52 to 77 years. Now here we go, here's part of the limitation, spoiler alert. However, it's also a benefit of the study. So 11 parents possessed a post-secondary or graduate degree and one completed high school. So as a limitation, we do know that typically the average caregiver in schizophrenia is below the average income level of, of a Canadian, what our mean income is. Um, so in terms of education and in terms of income, these people were at a, a higher socio-demographic uh, percentile. Um, however, at the same time, it just goes to show that if these people with all this education and means to perhaps, you know, think through or had the education or training or connections or whatever you might think somebody with a higher socio-demographic status might have, they still face the same challenges. Um, and I think that that's a benefit to show that even with this. So six parents were employed, one was unemployed, five were retired. And here's your gross annual uh, household income. It ranged from 50 to 175, with an average of more than 100,000 per year. So again, a uh, higher income bracket, but this tends to be the way it is when you do a convenient sample. Being a student, I have to work with kind of what I can, and uh, people who do tend to have a higher education level are shown to be more likely to participate in research. So I take who I can get, and this is an educated group, and that's what it is, and I call it what it is. So this is what I found. Um, when you do qualitative research, you can look at themes and sub-themes or categories and subcategories. So this is how I titled them based on looking through all of the data and looking for patterns and, and seeing what I could see. So two main categories, uncertainty and change, consisted of couldn't put a finger on it. That's actually a direct quote from one of the participants and why I named it that. Things I do things I thought I would never have to do, how do I do what I need to do, and then caregiving effects on my life, the bad and the good. That's the way I chose to represent those categories. So the main category was uncertainty and change. So parents' uncertainties in their caregiving roles are described and the changes that they had to embed in their parenting practices. There's those subcategories. So here's the first one, couldn't put a finger on it. So I'm just going to read real quickly here. So parents described having difficulty identifying the onset of schizophrenia. Their symptoms of the illness were misattributed to other physical or mental disorders or were confused with kind of normal teenage behavior, making it hard uh, for parents to seek appropriate care early on. This person says, he seemed to be the same son kind of thing, but there were really quirky things that you just couldn't put your finger on it. It did not make sense in my world, but you knew there was some confusion. You just couldn't put a finger on it. And this is a theme that came out with a, a number of parents, actually, and it makes sense because what we know is that the prodromal phase can look like just a bit unusual. Maybe people withdrawing, maybe not being the same old you that you used to be. So this was a major finding. Um, without knowing the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia, they had difficulty making sense of it. In hindsight, like I said, they were symptoms of prodromal phase or first episode psychosis. But yet he was still, I would not say he was psychotic. He was with it, but to me it seemed like he was in a really bad depression. Like, did not, like you'd go grocery shopping and he wouldn't go in the store with you and that kind of thing. So another example, for one parent, the uncharacteristic thoughts and behaviors were first actually interpreted as maybe a physical problem. And I'm going, what the hell? I dismissed the thoughts that were really in my head. I had no clue what was happening. Absolutely no clue. In my head, he had a brain tumor because it just seemed like the day before he was fine. Parents, in this case, now we're in the things that I do. So parents, caregivers do a number of things for their child. And of course, this is limited to our presentation length. But some examples, uh, parents do groceries, prepare meals, run errands, um, and provide significant social and financial support for their adult children. This is what this person said. I make all the meals. I do all the groceries. There's still times when my son doesn't want to go to the store. He's got a car, he can drive to the store, or he'll send me an email saying, can you stop and get such and such? 
And another uh, parent said, to elaborate a little more on the money issue, if we didn't intervene, his money would be gone before the end of the month. <laughs> so talking to him and getting his cooperation, we asked him to give us his money to hold on to. Um, and then we would dole out the grocery money as time went on in the month. And also in terms of spending the money, I take him to the grocery store and I spend his money. He chooses the stuff, I spend his money. So this parent says, we're spending a lot of time figuring out all of the issues around the will. Again, a, very, a lot of parents reflected on this. And I spent a lot of time with financial advisors figuring out how much money we'll have and will that last him a certain amount going through all sorts of scenarios. I spent hours with our financial advisor going over that sort of thing as well. So things I do, another thing, a number of parents describe being like a counselor. So we talk a lot about that with him, safe decision making. And he has improved in that he knows he can't smoke marijuana and he's actually staying away from it. Um, so I'm not going to touch on the whole marijuana issue, but let's just face that uh, the facts that it can be very dangerous for a young mind who is, has the potential for schizophrenia or already has schizophrenia. I think those are some of the issues that weren't major uh, speaking points with legalization, but that we should think about what that means for people. Um, here we go. So educator. So a number of parents actually talked about being an educator for their child in, in certain ways. This parent said, your next step is to go to school, test it out. And I said, this is totally foreign to you, but you should be able to ace this. So if you need to read the chapter 10 times, you read the chapter 10 times. It's just the studying habits, so we'll do that. Actually had parents also talk about, you know, helping their children write uh, university papers, like they were really struggling and their, their kid was trying to finish the semester and so they'd be there working away all night trying to get this paper because they didn't want, you know, their kid to fall behind or lose the opportunity for a degree. Okay, so this is the new subcategory, things I thought I would never have to do. Uh, so. Here's one example. And again, every single parent in my study had interaction with the police. And I would imagine that for a number of caregivers, this is something that people go through. So in this case, things I thought I never had to do, parents explained how they found themselves in situations and doing things that they had never imagined would be necessary. They attributed these actions to their child's diagnosis and they described instances involving police as well as engaging in preventative actions to ensure um, and rearranging their home and social environments to ensure everyone's safety. So, like I said, everyone had involvement with the police and that could most often be traced back to the fact that they had concerns for the safety of their child or for themselves or for others. Sometimes it was an impact of just mental health law and other things that go into treatment, but. Um, most often it was the case that safety was at risk. This, this parent said, I've got a phone mobile crisis, which is a mental health uh, crisis response team. I was really scared she was going to do something crazy, like kill me or something. So the police eventually arrive, first the mobile crisis, then the cops, and then as quick as the destruction she made happened, it stopped. Police interventions uh, were very distressing, and as one parent described, it actually left them feeling vulnerable. And this is a good example of particularities of the illness that can be challenging, although there's a number. They feared uh, that their safety might be compromised as a result of taking the action of calling in police. Um, so in this case, the parent said, but he was so agitated that I phoned the police. And once you're there, you know, once you've done that, you open the doors to whatever's going to come down the driveway. We talked to the police officers and they felt that he should go to the hospital, but I thought he's not sick enough. <laughs> and that's a point we're going to talk about later as well. There didn't seem to be a bed and, you know, I just didn't want to get into this thing where we take him and then they send him home with us. And then he's angry that we've called the police, you know. So think about that in terms of being a, a vulnerable individual who loves your child very much, and yet you're kind of put between a rock and a hard place here. So 
So again, in, in this subcategory, things I thought I would never have to do. Uh, when parents describe preventive actions, they spoke of legal measures. A number of parents need to look into those kinds of things. Taken to ensure their guardianship, power of attorney, or substitute decision making. And these legal measures were taken to ensure that they had some decision making capacity should their child become incapable of making decisions for themselves. This parent said, in theory, uh, because we are our son's guardians, we could have forced the issue, but we're not going to go to court every time someone says no. This parent said, we did go to a lawyer when he first got sick, and we do have the trust, but also the forms that he gives us power of attorney. But we didn't have to. He always allowed us to be there at any appointments or decisions. We're very lucky. So they recognize that maybe it's not the same for other caregivers, and they consider themselves lucky that they haven't had to enact that role. Because as you can imagine, there could be a fair bit of friction, and, and parents don't always want to do these things. It's quite uncomfortable for the whole family. It can be devastating. So how do I do what I need to do? Boy, I wish I had the answer to this one. <laughs> However, um, parents describe significant difficulty with timely access to appropriate health care resources for their adult child with schizophrenia. And this was universal at the onset. It was a problem that every parent I spoke to had at the onset. But it also continued it uh, throughout the illness trajectory in terms of particularities of the illness, like maybe the last slide we talked about some issues there. <coughs> Here, parents uh, describe the distress they experienced when their child refused treatment. So long as they did not pose a significant risk to themselves or others, there were times in which treatment could be declined. Parents witnessed their child's illness state worsen, and they described feeling significantly distressed and very helpless to do anything about it. They continued to manage their child in the home, watching them slip further and further into the illness, just waiting for the worst to happen. And this one here, I think, that's coming up was probably one of the most, I don't know, I felt very obligated when I heard this parent say this to really do my best that I could with my research. So it's a long one, but it's a very good one. So each time he is not taking his medications, he's living in turmoil and distress. And the only advice that anyone could give me was, just take care of him the best that you can. Wait until he gets so sick that we can certify him. So you had to just sit there and watch him. Well, the worst that can happen, you know, is suicide for Christ's sake. Anyway, so waiting for him to become a harm to himself or to another person or to not be able to care for himself under the eyes of the law or the psychiatrist who has diagnosed him, that's hard. So if you can fix anything for parents, that's the thing to fix. You know, being told to watch somebody get so bad that you can bring in the law, basically. So that one really hit home and it was something that a number of parents expressed, but I think that quote really, wow. So, um, actually another, just before I move on, uh, another parent said, they kind of echoed that idea, you can't just walk and say, we need help. It needs to be the way the rules are. It has to be a crisis where somebody is about to get hurt or it's a criminal act to be able to get some attention, to get some access. So again, how do I do what I need to do? A, a number of people described instances in which they went to the emergency department looking for care. Uh, this parent said, we'd go to the emergency and they would just send us home. So I talked to his psychiatrist, and again, this was a very acute uh, illness trip point for this person, very ill. I talked to the psychiatrist and he said, just keep going back. And we had to keep going back to the emergency. I think we went about multiple nights and we sat there all night, of course. And it's sort of like, unless you go to emergency and he wants to kill himself or kill someone else, then they just send him home. And so actually I have, a, my supervisor does a, a fair bit of research on the emergency department and people who frequently present to the emergency department with mental health concerns and looking at what their experiences are. So I was fortunate to work with her on uh, one of these studies and it was really eye-opening in terms of what these people experience when they go there. 
This parent said, the system isn't geared to supporting people quickly. We wasted quite a bit of time before we could get on the right path, as it were. And it's very stressful, of course. You're going down wrong roads, and you're having to come back, and there's conditions that are continuing, and the stress is continuing in the family that whole time. So this is just where we're going to, I'm just orienting you to where we're going to now, which is caregiving effects on my life. So we'll start with the bad and go into the good. So a major finding, of course, was that parents feel a lot of psychological distress, and understandably so. If you've been listening to some of these quotes, it's a very difficult illness to be a caregiver for someone. So there was a lot of psychological distress. So it kind of echoed the things that I saw in the literature. There was a lot of, of feeling of guilt, uh, actually, and parents blaming themselves. Like I said, when I, when I was talking about that slide that people fluctuate and they move through the, the phases, a lot of people felt blame or guilt if their child became ill that maybe they didn't do enough. But in particular, at the onset of the illness, there was a lot of guilt or blame about not getting their child into treatment faster. There should have been something they should have done. They should have, you know, really found their way. They should have figured it out sooner. Uh, a lot of blame. And so as a healthcare provider and someone who works in a mental health system and within our healthcare system, I certainly feel that very bad that people are blaming themselves and that our systems are at fault for, for a lot of that, actually. Worry, fear, feeling helplessness uh, were common, and uh, devastation. Parents particularly even used the word devastation when describing what they were going through. This person said he would see them sitting in the corner, making fun of him. Like, there were times he would say to me, Mom, did you just see that? And I said, what do you see? And then he'd start telling me what he saw, and I was like, oh my God, like, what he sees, what he feels. And that's where I was just I, starting to feel the devastation of his world. I think we went into a devastating period, and then it's like denial. This can't be happening. It just can't be happening. I mean, who does this happen to? So sleep was a major finding. A lot of parents really had a hard time sleeping, especially when they've got an acutely ill child at home and the symptoms are intense and not by our clock for sure. A lot of people are having reverse sleeping patterns and so day and night. Um, this caused a lot of distress for the parents because they couldn't sleep and they, they had to be hyper vigilant and monitoring their children throughout the day in the home if they couldn't get them to hospital. And uh, they had significant challenges, therefore, sleeping. While um, her son was quite ill, one parent based her own sleep schedule on his erratic pattern, and she would just nap her way through the day when he was sleeping. You know, he's awake, okay, I'm awake. He's asleep, okay, I'll, I'll catch a few minutes, you know. And so another parent said, and when he was manic and walking around at all hours of the night, it's hard to get any sleep because we'd be sleeping on edge all night. You're always wondering what's going to happen. Just the walking around when you're trying to sleep and it's right outside your door. His parent said, I've attempted to sleep in my car. There's locks changed on different doors in my house. I've slept with the phone in the room in case I needed to get help. So I don't want everybody to think that that's the experience. This is obviously people talking about some of the most challenging periods in their life and, and how that impacted them, um, but some serious impacts for sure. Mm -hmm. Work and career. A number of parents did talk about that, and it did have significant impact on their working life and their career. So in terms of maybe the hours that they could work if they needed time off, some parents would uh, decline job opportunities because they wanted to make sure that their child was okay or they just couldn't do it because their child was so ill. Another, some parents actually talked about prioritizing the length of that stable period. Like, you know, maybe I'll, I'll look at getting back to work, but first I need to make sure that he's okay. I need him to be stable for X amount of time so that I can trust if I go back to work that he might be okay. So putting off that for themselves also. 
So this person said, I was supposed to go to, you know, an international place for meetings. I had to just say, I'm not going. And, you know, people were disappointed. They wanted me to go because they needed that particularity and I just didn't do it. So people had problems engaging meaningfully in the workplace. Uh, this affected their decisions around retirement. When they would retire, some parents um, would retire early because their own health was affected and they needed to take care of themselves or they felt the need to be home for their child. Other parents actually put off retirement significantly because of the economic burden that they faced for being a caregiver. They weren't able to retire when they thought they might. And they did that to kind of recover financial losses. Finally, the effects of stigma. So parents explained how they felt the effects of stigma and several parents feared the reactions of others and opted not to disclose their child's diagnosis as a result. Reflecting on their interactions with colleagues. So one parent actually stated, and this made me sad really because I have such a great number of colleagues that I can share my life with, but she says, I always went to the staff room for lunch, but I had a policy of never asking anybody else about their kids because I didn't want them to ask me questions. So I never asked questions and I just hope that nobody would ask me. I mean, it's sad, like really to have so much of your life that's spent at work and not being able to share with your colleagues in a meaningful way. Um, it's really sad. So here's the good, yay! <laughs> so there are some good aspects. Uh, you know, I, I still have to, uh, you know, talk with my committee about all the findings and, and what we're going to be discussing. Thesis is just about done, so I do have um, some implications for the research. However, um, proportionately, there was a lot of negative experience that we talked about. So I'm not just going to be like, hey, there's this great study that I did and everybody has a great time being a caregiver and let's, you know, because it's not the reality. I'm not going to kind of sugarcoat what the experience is. There is some positive things that come out of being a caregiver, however. Um, so for example, a number of parents described to me how they'd found meaningful volunteer opportunities with organizations in the community and for, with nonprofit organizations. Some parents were involved in social housing committees and in areas in which they could learn to uh, build social support networks for people who do have disability like, like schizophrenia. So there are some organizations that do that. They create a supportive network around the person. People had done fundraising initiatives, guest speaking. They had done uh, support groups. This person said, people are referred to them, and then they ask me if I can talk to people, and then I can refer them to other places. I was always trying to help my son be, become more independent, and one of the things would be to help him find a place to live. So in addition to organized activities, parents also engage in informal activities, such as becoming an informal resource to other people, so people at work, friends, others in the community. So in terms of informal, uh, one parent caregiver said to someone in their support, uh, their child support network, I said, I'm going to meet you. I'll answer questions. You just ask. And because of that, they still stay in touch with him. The relationship is not the same because he's not the same. But they're still together and they still invite him places. So that's an example where a parent really intervened and recognized the importance of those social relationships and trying to maintain those. And that is one example. Another person said, I have counseled or helped find resources for other staff members who are having issues with family members because one or two people have an idea of what's going on. So they'll come and say, do you happen to know? They won't ask me directly, you know, about what's going on in my house, but they'll say, do you think you could help me find dot, dot, dot? <laughs> and of course I do. <clears throat> Another aspect was personal growth. Um, so people had expressed an enhanced uh, ability to understand other people who might be going through challenges because they were able to see that challenge through with their own children and, and it made them more sensitive to others who were facing struggles. 
facing vulnerable populations. So for example, people who might be homeless, it sheds some insight on maybe how they got there and people are more sensitive. And really kind of putting things into perspective. Um, so this caregiver said, you really learn what's important in life when your child is sick because all of a sudden work or being productive or the silly things that you worry about aren't important anymore. And finally, this parent said, if it hadn't been for my daughter being who she was, I wouldn't do the things that I do. I kind of like that. I always look at that and think I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for my daughter to be who she was, for me to do the things that I've done in my life. So it's, it's kind of nice in that way. So that's my mission in life, you know, to help others. And so uh, this is the end of my proportion. The lights didn't go out. So thank you very much, everyone, for coming and for listening. Thank you. Thank you.